If you are sitting at home next to your radio, you're hearing the music faster than you are if you're in the hall. Listening for the secret, searching for the sound. This is the Sound Podcast with Ira Haberman. A West Coast musician, the child prodigy of two parent musicians, Natalie Cressman in 2009 made the move east to Manhattan School of Music. It was that move that likely changed her life forever. Since that time, she has graduated from the school and has gone out to carve out a niche of her own as an accomplished trombonist playing with the likes of Trey Anastasio, Motet, and Umphreys McGee. As a singer-songwriter, she has also recorded two albums of her own and will be releasing an R&B-laden EP, Traces, this week. We caught up with Natalie and asked her what led to the move to New York and the Manhattan School of Music. I was involved in this high school program called the Grammy Jazz Ensemble. So it's, um, uh, you have, um, people audition from all over the country in high school. And um, if you get accepted, you get to come to L.A. and play in this student um, jazz big band and play all the Grammy pre and after parties and certain events. So it's a really amazing experience. And um, the band director was actually the dean of Manhattan School of Music. So it was right around my senior year when I was deciding where to go. And I'd applied to a bunch of different music schools and other academic places as well. Um, But I was kind of leaning more towards the conservatory route because I was really getting into playing trombone and wanting to do that for a living. And so essentially um, getting to know the dean face to face ahead of time kind of gave me, you know, an opportunity to have him hear me personally before even the audition process had taken place. So I actually was offered a full ride to Manhattan School of Music and um, it, they had the faculty that I really wanted to study with, Luis Bonilla, who is a great New York City trombonist. And and then I also studied with Wycliffe Gordon, who joined the faculty a little later on. Um, and they're, they're some of the most amazing trombonists and, and teachers. So that's kind of what made that school stand out to me and also just kind of getting a sense of what it was about by um, working with the dean of jazz, Justin DeChocho, for a week. Uh, and, and your parents, obviously, who are musicians themselves, they must have been ecstatic that you decided, not that you were going away, you were going to be so far away from your mom, that must have freaked her out, but uh, ecstatic <laughs> that you were going to the Manhattan School of Music. I mean, that's a that's a great school, right? Yeah, they were really happy about it. I mean, obviously, they miss me, but they're traveling musicians as well so we've you know kind of already ripped the band-aid off of being away from home I mean my dad's been on for every other month since I was nine so the idea of me moving away didn't scare them as much as probably most moms and dads because like we've already you know gotten accustomed to the kind of long distance (laughs) um, familial relationship. So there you are you're at the Manhattan School of Music and uh, Trey plucks you out of school to be the trombonist for tab yeah um well actually i was i managed to stay in school and graduate in four years um which because trey has that other band that keeps him quite busy so <laughs> we have um not you know, familiar with the, it i guess it was a blessing in disguise um to not be working that much with tab it, you know we were only going on tour in two or three week increments and that's about as much as um my college would allow for professional leave and I actually, any time that it was a little over two weeks, I had some like teachers in my corner that would kind of help help me fudge the dates, and I could like pretend I was sick or just like in town but not able to make it to class. <laughs> like <laughs> I was able to graduate by the skin of my teeth. Um, and, what, can we uh, but, wait? Hold on, I got to ask about something because that's amazing to me. You're playing with a world renowned musician at sold out venues across North America and probably the tour. Uh, probably uh, probably mm-hmm. the world, sorry. And you had to fudge your attendance so that you wouldn't be seen as missing class. Yep. Yeah, they did not. <laughs> wow. I mean, they gave me professional leave, but like it's a very strict jazz conservatory. And actually, um, by the end of my time there, I was getting kicked out of bands because of my attendance. Um, it was just, yeah, they totally, <laughs> there's totally a double standard in regards to if it had been jazz at Lincoln Center. Even I had a friend who did like an unpaid rehearsal at Jasmine Lincoln Center and he was able to skip his band rehearsal, (laughs) but I was out touring playing really big venues across the country and it wasn't okay for me to miss my big 
you know, big band rehearsal. So it was just, there was, yeah, it was because it wasn't jazz. They didn't quite understand um, the scope of what I was doing and the fact that it actually is really complex, diverse music that was stretching me as an artist. They just had no idea and didn't care to know because they it wasn't jazz. So they just kind of didn't validate it. You couldn't get a note from Mr. Anastasio. Please excuse Natalie from class as she. <laughs> I mean, I was almost at that point where I was going <laughs> to try and get somebody involved because I was getting so much unnecessary heat. And I actually remember my first jam cruise. Um, I had this one. It was hilarious. It's, it's a, a music career class. Um, and the lady had a very strict attendance policy where if you missed more than one class a semester, you couldn't get an A automatically. You, ha- you have to get a B or a C. Um, even if you did everything else perfectly, which I was like totally turning in my work early, like before I went on tour so that I'd cover all my bases. And so I actually had to buy, like, I remember it was like $60 internet for one night on Jam Cruise so I could Skype in to a music career class so that she wouldn't lower my grades. <laughs> Music career <laughs> class while you're on tour. I'm like here, yeah, that's yeah. amazing. The irony was lost on them, but uh, I thought it was pretty hilarious. Oh, it's awesome! Well, congratulations on graduating and uh, <laughs> getting everything done and being able to go on tour. That's that's on, on so many tours. That's amazing. Um, so, so what's that been like? I mean, you know, you have this other life when Tab isn't playing. What's it been like? Mm-hmm playing music with so many talented musicians besides just Trey, but everybody in that band is, you know, so talented. What, what's that whirlwind been like for you as, as such a uh, young musician? You know, it's been really great. I, I kind of am very eclectic in terms of, I don't like to play like the same music, you know, every night for all year, you know, yeah, yeah. for my whole career. I love how it's kind of evolving and like there are these different like, phases as the year goes on like where I'm touring with Tab and that looks like one thing and then on tour with my band and that's a completely different animal um and then getting to work with you know different groups and artists kind of as a special guest or or kind of one-off shows so I I really like that it's you know it's a very varied experience for me um and it kind of keeps me growing because I'm not I feel like once you get too comfortable in one thing the, the improvement and the growth kind of stops. So I get to kind of be thrown in these situations that keep making me feel challenged. And like, I'm, you know, I, I guess there's, you know, music isn't finite. So there's no like, Oh, I've learned it all. And I'm there, you know, you're constantly like working to like better yourself and, and hone your craft. So I think for me, the different experiences that, you know, have being involved in like so many different bands, um, it keeps it fresh and keeps me kind of moving forward. I think. And and so it's reflected in your solo work too. I mean, uh, the two, the the three records now. The last one with Mike Bono is, you know, very singer songwriter type thing um, with some mm-hmm. trombone, obviously. But traces the traces EP is a total departure from from that stuff. And I'm curious about. Yeah. I'm curious. I'm curious about what well, we talked about. You know, being an eclectic musician, and obviously hearing eclectic music is probably a big part of of what you do on a on a daily, on a consistent basis, if not daily basis. But what made you take this leap now into such a, you know, R and B kind of dance kind of zone? What what made you take that leap? Well, I started listening to different artists that were kind of doing that. I mean, I'm definitely coming from more of a singer songwriter place. But hearing artists like Kimbra and King and um, even to some degree Hiatus Coyote that, you know, that have really kind of added this complexity to dancey grooves and, and kind of R&B, but like it's a very modern sound. And so I kind of was getting that into my head. And I really like the idea of, of, you know, staying true to who I am musically, but also like maybe bringing in a different group of people that, you know, might not enjoy the show if it was all trombone solos every song. But if, you know, if the songs are good and they're presented in such a way where there is some, you know, musical meat for like the the mus- musician, you know, artsy types that they can still kind of dig in, but also it's presented in this aesthetic where it kind of is relatable to more people. I kind of wanted to try it, it was definitely a challenge to kind of keep that balance of like keeping my art, artistic integrity in check intact and then um and then also trying to kind of reach out to this new 
um, new audience, this new style, um, and including this new aesthetic into what I was doing. Uh, from an aesthetic point of view, uh, it's gorgeous, by the way. The whole EP is really pretty. But, you know, Thank the you. foundation of being a singer-songwriter is still there. And certainly being a singer, I mean, you're still having to sing, you know, some crazy notes and, and, and do some crazy things with your voice that you probably experimented a bit with when you were just, you know, singer-songwriter, uh, Natalie Cressman. Mm-hmm. But but certainly there's a, a wider range of uh, ability and 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 temptation now with this, this style of music, right? Yeah. And I mean, I think for me, I, I really enjoy music that's unpredictable. Like I love so many styles of music, but that's one thing that I really uh, across the board respond to. So I think for me, that will always be there in my singing, no matter what genre of music might fall into. I'm always going to be kind of trying to push for some surprises in one way or another. How involved were you with the production? I mean, besides vocals and the trombone parts, uh, do you play any other instruments on the record? Um, well, I, I actually all the entire record started as um, demos programmed by me. So I didn't play. I mean, I played keys and I programmed the drums and um, you know created synth parts and and such. So that was it was definitely the most involved I've been on the production side ever because they really started out as these. You know, they were rough around the edges, but the songs were fully done when I brought them into the producer. And then from there, we changed up a couple of grooves and take, took some things out and tweaked some things that were there and then added the rest of the band in. Um, but yeah, I definitely like was for the first time more of a producer in like the sense nowadays where you are making the beat and writing every element of the song. Um, But my producer, Ivan Jackson, then also put his stamp on it. And definitely like a lot of the songs wouldn't be, you know, achieve the end result that they have without someone that does that for a living. But um, but I mean, in the past, I've made really live records that were basically my band in a room recording. And so I was I was a producer in that, you know, I was overseeing the way that the record was made. But this was the first time that I actually kind of like was hands on working on it um in a you know uh performance um soft you know recording software yeah i mean it's so easy now right i mean if you're as talented mm-hmm. as you are you just open garage band or logic pro or whatever on your laptop and you can pretty much do anything you oh well you can i i can't do anything but most you know <laughs> Uh, talented people can absolutely probably do anything now with with their laptop or even their their iPad for heaven's sake right I mean it's it's crazy yeah I mean it's definitely like the more you know there are more Logic Pro is great and like Ableton and Pro Tools are are the ones that I've dealt with the most right but but yeah everyone there's an entry point for anyone to get um kind of get their hands that you know get their hands on on like that software and be able to make their own music from anywhere, which is very cool. And then I think that there is this like kind of extra level of, of mastery that I'm definitely not at as a producer, Mm -hmm. but I recognize it in other producers. So it's like everyone can do it, but then there's like the people that really stand out when they they're living and breathing it and really know the software, like the back of their hand. You probably can give yourself a break in that you've not really been doing this for that long and and really you've accomplished so much but you haven't been doing it for that long that you know it's okay to rely on other people to to do some of this stuff i guess unless you're yeah a a bit of a control and also yeah i mean i think it's great to involve other people and like especially like working with my band like i definitely like write all the material but i love kind of empowering everyone to put their own um style into it and kind of follow their own musical intuition because i think like we're just you know two heads are better than one it's the more people that that get involved the you know the more like the more that the songs can develop with like because there's like a different perspective um when you're coming into a song that's already done they might hear something that you know i just have you know have been living with the song for too long to see that it needs this element or that this section needs to be repeated or taken out so i think it's always great to kind of be collaborative at, at some point because i think it it leads you to new places that you can't think of alone in your room <laughs> i'd be remiss if i didn't ask you about madison square garden and new year's eve i was mm-hmm. sitting here yeah. in my den watching it and 
Well, you know, the whole spectacle of Petrichor to begin with was kind of crazy. Uh, but then yes. when when the cats and dogs started coming down, I, I don't think there were cats. Mm-hmm. I think it was only dogs. You guys, no, there were cats. There oh, were there cats were cats too? too? Oh, amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You were I remember because bar- I took one home with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were like literally you couldn't play because you were being buried in these balloons. Like how? I how- know. <laughs> and I could see all your faces that you guys were – did you expect it to be that much of an onslaught? Like it was just hilarious no, watching No, I mean we did a test run with the rain and like the rest of the, you know, um, the dancers and the and the umbrella choreography. I don't know what else to call it. Yeah. Um, but we – the cats and dogs were like looming above us and we just didn't get – we didn't ever run that part where they actually came down. So, yeah, it ended up being a lot. Of balloons, and actually, one of the techs, a poor guy, he his job was to get on stage and feverishly pop the balloons to make room so that like Mike and Trey could like see their their pedal rigs and stuff. But it was just so funny because like they look like cats and dogs, and it looks like you know this this you know one of one of like the best techs that you know I work with in Trey Band is just like murderously like killing <laughs> yeah. these cats and dogs, like popping the balloons. <laughs> uh, you guys didn't miss a beat, though, right? The the horn section, Mike, Trey, nobody. I mean, there was one point where even I saw Paige, like the piano was literally covered in balloons, and none yeah. of you missed a beat. Like uh, amazing, talented yeah. musicians. Well, I think we kind of are conditioned to kind of be able to tune things out. I mean, I've done many a gig where people are, you know, drunkenly yelling at me or whatever, something happens, and you kind of, the music can't really stop like that. So you can't really let your outside environment pull you out of the music. And that's definitely something that's like learned over time and experience. And I mean, especially the the members of Fish, they're, you know, much more seasoned than I. So I'm not surprised that they just kept going because that's just kind of what we're conditioned to do as musicians. You should send that video to your teachers at Manhattan School of Music. I know. I'm like, see where I am now? <laughs> well, it's funny because actually after after I graduated, they put my, my picture in the in the program book for the school, like, you know, with the the thing that they showed a prospective student and they were kind of bragging about how I tour with fish, which was not true. Right. I didn't even get it quite right. But it was just so funny that like, while I was there, I was getting penalized for (laughs) being in this cool band. And the second I graduated, the like PR department for the school was like, Oh, Natalie's doing cool things. Let's talk about her. Uh, What's next for you? You're going to tour this record a little bit, obviously. Uh, Well, you're playing with your mom, right? Did you play with your mom already? I did last night. Yeah, How that was, was that? that's why I'm in California. It was so great. It was really lovely. I always love playing in the Bay Area because it's um, super fam. You know, there's tons of family out here, and so it's, it feels very welcoming. So we had a great night at the Freight and Salvage. Um, and so my, my duo with Mike Bono opened, and then I got to play with my mom and dad, which doesn't happen as often as it should anymore because we're so busy. So that was really special. And then I just dropped them off at the airport. They're going to Brazil. And I'm going to join them next week for a little bit as well. I've never been. So I'm doing a lot of traveling this year. I went to Israel, going to Brazil, um, and just kind of trying to absorb some new experiences and get, you know, some new lyric ideas and sounds and kind of start compiling, like, the little seeds of what I want the next record to be, yeah, you do, know, do you planted think about, from. Do you, do, are you... Are you- considering doing another R&B record or is it going to be I guess that's something that you know the music or or the lyrics will kind of force you into or experience will force you into one direction or another right yeah I I mean I think that I'll definitely make another record that's kind of similar to the Tracy EP in that it's you know my songs that are kind of with a you know, some extra care put into the production so that it's a little different than the live experience. But beyond that, I don't really know what it'll end up being. And then I also have been having so much fun in the duo because it's so stripped down and it's got, you know, this, you know, delicacy and, and subtlety to it that kind of gets lost when you add like big, a big crashy, you know, heavy drum beat, you know? So I think I can see myself kind of continuing with both projects. Um, been really obsessed with Brazilian music lately and working with some Brazilian musicians out in California. So that's another direction that I can see myself going. And I'm just kind of trying to follow what I'm really inspired about right now. And then hopefully, you know, some, but you know, by the end of this year have, you know, a bunch of new songs to kind of pick from. 
Uh, you're touring now uh, with with Mike a little bit. Um, yeah, we're doing a mini a mini California tour, and um, and then I'll be doing some CD release shows out east in March, and uh, out west in May. But then you're coming back east for Trey tour in May, right? Yes, yeah. That I'll be I'll be touring with Trey in April and, and May and some of June. I only say that because um, I'm here in Toronto. So psyched to see the band again. The last time you guys played here, I don't know if you remember. It is still. It remains with me as one of probably the top five shows I've seen in the city since I've been seeing shows. Oh Just, yeah, I remember. It was like I think it was a tour open. It was like the first night of, a, yeah. of one of our tours. And these guys were just and on it was, fire. Yeah, I remember it being really fun. Yeah, <laughs> we were excited to see each other and play again. <laughs> that was sure. For Great. Sure. Well, continued success, Natalie. Really appreciate your time. Really appreciate the music, all of the music that you make. And uh, we, as I said, we can't wait to see you again in in May. So uh, congratulations on Trace's EP. Thank you. And uh, and it's out in March, so people should know that they can go to nataliecressman.com to find out more about it. And we'll put provide a link on our site as well uh, in March. And um, looking forward to seeing what's up soon. All right. Thanks a lot, Natalie. Really appreciate awesome. it. Thanks. Great chatting with you. The breadth of Natalie's talent is significant, playing all kinds of music. For more information on Natalie, you should check out her website at nataliecressman.com. But for now, have a listen to Radio Silence from the Traces EP.
the cut me down My star ascends my do you good To treat me right Well, it's time to make amends You, you're the friend who made me all sad You've been listening to The Sound Podcast. Technical production by Adam Karsh and Andrea Ruse. Inspired by the Grateful Dead and you, their fans. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And find us at thesoundpodcast.com.